Hi everyone. Today I want to continue the part into the part two now of the last sermon. Are you saved? And do you have a part in your salvation? I'm going to show there is a part, but it might surprise some of you the way I explain it. I hope you'll study it though and give it careful regard. In my last sermon, we talked about salvation and uh, how it's being saved. We're being saved from the penalty of our, of our sins. The wages, what we earn from sin, the wages of sin is death. And the gift of God is eternal life, which is from Romans 6, 23. So we're saved by the shed blood, which is the life. Life is in the blood of Jesus Christ, Yeshua, the Messiah, Son of God. And that's God's gift. We must be saved and there is no salvation possible under any other name. That's what Peter said in Acts 4, verse 12, that uh, there, there's no other, no other name under heaven given by which we must be saved. So hello, I'm Philip, Philip Shields, and very happy to be here with you. I'm glad so many of you do come to the website. I appreciate that very much. I'd actually love to hear from some of you, a note, an email, and um, just see how things are going and what suggestions you might have, or just to hear from you. I, I, I'd love that. Anyway, so um, we now have well over 350 sermons, 67 or so of those are video sermons. We'll be doing probably 60, 70% sermons that are videos going forward, and then maybe 30% that are audios. So keep watching for the audio sermons too. When we need to get something posted really quickly or a shorter topic or something, it'll probably be an audio. So please, please check those out. <clears throat> Scripture says those who believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God and that he rose from the dead, risen by God the Father. And if you repent and believe in him, surrender your life to him as your Lord, as your commander, as your leader, as your Savior and King, then you will be saved. That's what it says in Romans 10, verses 9 and 10. Saved from the penalty of our own sins, which is our own death. Jesus, Yeshua, died for me, died for you, the innocent dying for the guilty. Even in the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, they would take an innocent goat or lamb or something and um, that had done nothing wrong. And then the sins of the person who was trying to be atoned for would lay their hands on the, on the head of the goat or sheep or lamb, somewhat transferring it. But the Bible is very clear that those were just symbols of what actually could pay the penalty. The life of bulls and goats and sheep can't pay for the penalty of sin. Hebrews tells us that, Hebrews 10, I believe. So Christ redeemed me, paid, the debt, paid for my debt that I couldn't pay. I couldn't pay my debt unless I died, offered to die for my own life. And so he paid for it with his own innocent life. At that point, we're also told in John 3, 16 and, and John 3, 36, and 1 John 5, verses 11 to 13, at that point we're given, once we believe in Jesus Christ, we're given eternal life. That's all part of salvation. Going from the extreme that you have to die to the other extreme, if you will, of eternal life. Eternal life. So most people, I covered this last time, most people think of, of Jesus as the Savior of mankind, and that's correct. But the complete story is that God the Father is also our Savior. I showed lots of scriptures last time. I hope you will all listen to part one. Now, there's a lot in there. So God the Father is also our Savior as well as Jesus Christ. They work together as one. Salvation was, after all, God the Father's idea. God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son, John 3, 16, that whosoever believes on him would not perish but have everlasting life. Then the next verse I love, God didn't send him to condemn. So we believers shouldn't have a condemning tone or attitude as well. God did not send him to the world to condemn the world, but that the whole world through him might be saved. The Savior so is also God the Father, Titus 3, 4, and Jesus Christ working as one. And Paul or uh, Peter said, there is no salvation possible under any other name. Not you, not me. Just God working through Jesus Christ. 
So when God saves us by the blood, that means by the death. The blood is the death. Life is in the blood. It took the innocent life to pay that debt. But this blood does a lot of things. I covered last time, just a quick review first here. It not only pays the debt, not only takes you off of the death penalty, but it also removes God's wrath, Romans 5.9, on us who believe. It removes God's wrath, Romans 5.9. <clears throat> it reconciles us. We were cut off. We were separated by our sins. It reconciles us back to God and brings us near to him again. Gives us boldness to enter the Holy of Holies. Uh, Hebrews 10, 19, and so many other things. And if you're not saved, you're still under the death penalty. You're still under the wrath of God. And, he, and you don't have eternal life. So if you ask me if I'm saved, I'm, I'm going to say, hallelujah, brother, absolutely I am. Because the Bible speaks in terms of having been saved, are saved, were saved, so many, so many places. So you want to know you have eternal life. John 3, 36, he who believes in the Son has everlasting life. Those of you who may not know about it, there are notes that go with the video sermons and audio sermons, and you can look those up even as I'm speaking or print them out ahead of time. And he who does not believe in the Son shall not see life, <clears throat> but the wrath of God abides on him. All right? I'm going to ask you a quick question I'd like you to be thinking about. hope I remember to come back to it. What happens now as a saved, believing child of God, believed in Jesus Christ, accepted his sacrifice for us, we're now redeemed, blessed children of God. What happens to you now after that, if sometime after that, as you surely will, you sin? I repent of my sins practically every day. Want to make sure that any sins are forgiven. But what happens after you sin as a believer, as a child of God? Do you once again get separated from the love of God? Do you once again come under the wrath of God? Do you once again lose your eternal life? Because you've sinned, you lied, let's say. I want you to really think about that because I think it's totally different. Once we uh, come to God and are part of his sheep, in fact, if we go, go astray, he'll come looking for us, Jesus says in John 10. He'll come looking for us. And uh, he, we know his voice. We follow him. He knows we're there. We're known by him and he knows us. And if we do sin, 1 John 1, verse 7 through 9 says that he's faithful and just to cleanse us and wash us from all sins and unrighteousness. And he cleanses, ongoing tense. And then a couple of verses later, or well, the very next verse, actually, 1 John 2, verses 1 and 2, uh, I, 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 I ask you that you, you don't sin. I hope that you aren't sinning. John says, but if and when you do sin, you have a, an advocate with God, Jesus Christ the righteous, who comes and defends us. So I hope you understand, <clears throat> when I sin, I don't panic and think, oh dear, I've lost it now. I'm going to hell. I'm going to go to the lake of fire. No, I don't. Any more than a child who does something wrong. I'm a child of God now. I wasn't before. But as a, if, as a child does something wrong, he knows he, he might get disciplined. God might discipline me for the sins. But I'm not cut off. Nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. It says in Romans 8 towards the end of the chapter. Nothing. So anyway, you really want to be saved from sin, not just the penalty of sin. But from sin itself, from sinning. Now that's a large part of what I'm going to be talking about today. The part two, if you will. Part one is being forgiven of our sins. Part two is what happens after that as we live day by day. How, how do we get help from sinning? We've been called to overcome, to grow, to be converted. And we'll find out how in this sermon today. So first of all, we're, we're forgiven. I mentioned this part two last time. We're forgiven from our, by our own sins. We're forgiven of our own sins. They're washed away. And we're also forgiven and removed from <clears throat> the curse of Adam. We're removed from the curse of Adam. Romans 5, verses 12 to 19 makes that very, very clear. Uh, Adam's sin is canceled on us who believe. Adam's guilt when he sinned was imputed to all mankind. One man's sin was imputed to all mankind. And in Romans 5, it goes on to say, 
in the same way, one man's righteousness, Yeshua's righteousness, is imputed to all of us. When I say Yeshua, most of you coming here know I mean Jesus. Yeshua means salvation. Hebrew word probably was the name he heard over and over again, even at the Passover service. When they were singing through Psalm 118 and other, other psalms that they would sing at Passover. Uh, you have become my Yeshua. You have become my salvation. His very name was being sung sometimes. <clears throat> so I love to say Yeshua. The name Jesus wasn't heard for centuries. Not that pronunciation everything. But we still keep falling. Okay, Adam's sin is removed from us. God's obedience, Christ's righteousness and obedience transferred to us. But we still keep failing. Paul says that, as I mentioned towards the end of last sermon, in Romans 7, that which I hate, I still do. He says that a couple times. He says, in fact, that's not me doing it anymore. That's the old self. That's the former me. That's not the new me. I still have that dead body in me called the old self. And it keeps rearing its ugly head somehow and sinning. And it's not me. That's what he said. And he hated that about himself, that he still sometimes sinned. And he says, oh, I pray... Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And I thank Jesus Christ, my Lord, that he'll be the one to deliver me. So we keep failing there. <clears throat> so what does God do? These are points we have to come to understand. God credits you and me. God credits you and me with God's, his very own righteousness. And it materializes in us in the life of Jesus inside of us. John 14, I think it's verse 23, it says that uh, Jesus says that, you know, if you love us and we love you and all that, and if you're keeping my commandments, uh, he says, my father and I will come and abide, dwell in you, father and I. So believe it. I didn't have that in my notes. But I, I'm pretty sure it's John 14, 23. But Romans 5, 17 says the gift, God gives us a gift of his very own righteousness. Romans 4, verses 23 to 25, which I'll read in fully minutes, minutes from now. Um, again, just like the righteousness of God was credited, imputed to Abraham, it also is imputed to us. I hope you guys believe that. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians 5, 21, a verse I use often. God, he made him who knew no sin, that was Jesus, to be sin for us. Not just a sin offering, but to be sin. All of the sins of the whole human, all of the whole world were put on him in Golgotha. He became sin, all right, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. The righteousness, it doesn't say that we might become righteous that we might become the righteousness of God in him. I don't think many of you really believe that. You've got to believe it. Even though the old carnal self still sins, and so we say, well, how is this the righteousness of God? Well, Paul divided it into two lives. The carnal old life, the old man, the old flesh, and the new creation life. So the righteousness of God is seen in that new creation side. <clears throat> so we receive Christ's life, we receive his new heart, and, and, and his new nature, the divine nature. We still have the fleshly heart, which is evil, deceitful, wicked above all things, and deceitful above all things. Who can know it? Jeremiah 17, 9. We still have that heart. But if you ask me now, what's, what's my heart really like now? The new heart. My new heart loves God. My new heart doesn't want to sin. My new heart wants to submit to God. My new heart is not deceitful and wicked, but wants to obey God and please him. The old heart, it says in Romans chapter 8, that can't please God, can't obey God, just can't. So we have these two conflicting natures. Paul found that very frustrating, as we all do. We read much of Romans 7 last time, and he says he kept on failing, kept on sinning, though he hated sin. In other scriptures, Paul is described as being filled with the Holy Spirit, like Acts 9, 17, for example. Yet he still sinned from time to time. 
That was because of the weakness of the flesh. So that's why he says, I thank God that Jesus Christ, my Lord, is going to deliver me from that other side. So be very cognizant that you still have that old nature. <clears throat> that's not the real you. That's why I spent some time last time in Romans 7 showing how Paul said, that's no longer I who's sinning, but the old man, the old self, the old nature that's sinning. We've also now been given the divine nature, not just the carnal fleshly nature, but the divine nature, 2 Peter 1.4. 2 Peter 1.4. So we have two hearts. One's deceitful. One is of God. Okay? David prayed for God. He said in Psalm 51 in his prayer of repentance for murdering Uriah and, and the sin with Bathsheba. <clears throat> David prayed to God, create in me, you, God, create in me a clean heart. I will not have a clean heart by all my effort in all the world because I'm not the creator. You can't give yourself or attain that clean heart by yourself. It has to come for, as a gift of God. It's God's creation in you. So in Psalm 51, create in me a clean heart, O God. It's around verse 10 or so. It might not be exactly that. And renew a right spirit within me. But Psalm 51. So God, not you, is the creator of all things, including our new life, including our new heart. He is our Savior, not me and not you. <clears throat> Now there's two parts to the salvation going on. The first part is being forgiven of all our sins. But let me read Romans 4, 23 to 25, talking about God's righteousness imputed, credited to Abraham. Romans 4, 23 to 25, I'm reading from the NIV, the New International Version. The words that was credited to him were written not for him alone, but also for us, to whom God will credit righteousness. For us who believe in him, in God, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered. Now watch the wording here. He was, Romans 4.25. He was delivered over to death for our sins. He had to die for our sins and was raised to life for our righteousness, for our justification, for our being made right with God, seen as righteous. He died for our sins. He was raised to life so we can be seen as righteous. I'm going to explain that because that has everything to do with your attitude about your calling and who you're going to be and who you are. So all sins are forgiven by his death. But now what? God's not going to leave us dangling there without the help we need to moment by moment after we first accepted Jesus as Savior. We still need saving in a sense moment by moment because we still will be sinning as well if we aren't careful with the things we'll be hearing about today. Romans 5.10, just a few verses after the one I just read you. Romans 5.10, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled to God, because sin separates you from God, now we're reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. A lot of people think we're saved by his death. In a sense, we are because his, his blood washes away all sins. That saves us in a sense. Yes, but more specifically, Scripture says we're saved by his life. Not by his death, by his life. This is a big thing for a lot of you. This is a new thing for all, a lot of you. Saved by his life. We're not saved by our new life. Saved by his life. This is key to understanding today's sermon. Saved by his life. This is what we need to understand. <clears throat> now the exciting transition to the next phase of how Yeshua totally and continues to save us day by day as we face the world. We have to combat and fight the world and be victorious. We have to fight Satan. We have to fight our human nature. He saves us by his life. He's the one who will give us th that victory. It will look like me fighting sin or fighting Satan or fighting the world or fighting my nature. It will look like it, but it really is Christ. This is very important. You get this. Anyway, so we're saved by his life. 
from death, yes, but he also saves us by his resurrection life, living fresh and new in us. Now, so the second stage, he knows we need help to moment by moment defeat the carnal nature and uh, to be totally converted to God's way, God's life, because we still have the carnal nature. Now, if it's Christ living in us, defeating this nature, guess what? Even this phase of salvation, though it looks like we're involved in it partly, we're, we're the ones maybe helping the neighbor who needs help, some good works or whatever, or we're resisting a temptation, we look the other way instead of being lured into lust uh, over a woman not dressed properly or whatever. I hope you women really try to help us guys more. Come on, don't dress like that. <laughs> but anyway, stage two, we need help moment by moment. We're still saved in this stage of salvation by grace. Okay, it's still God doing it. Now, how does Yeshua become our life? Bear with me, I'm going to show you how it happens. We do have a part to play in this transition, this salvation. And that part to play, as I'm going to explain more deeply as we go along, is to abide in Yeshua. Abide in Jesus. Be part of him. Remain in him. Live in him. Stick to him. And I'll be totally frank with you, though I preached this for decades, I don't think I totally understood it either. And I don't think I really grasped the power of this, the beauty of it, the grace of it, how deep it gets when you really understand it and ponder it. And I'm hoping, I'm hoping, oh God in heaven, just pour this understanding out to all the listeners that we all can understand this part of your grace. Hebrews 7, 24 to 25, anoint those who are hearing with your Holy Spirit to understand it. Anoint me preaching it to be true to your word. Amen. Thank you. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hebrews 7, the Bible says that when you pray, ask in Jesus' name. Okay. <clears throat> Jesus said that. Hebrews 7, 24, 25. But he, because he continues forever as an unchangeable priesthood, talking about Jesus Christ. Therefore, he's able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to do what? To make intercession for them. He's constantly working for us. That's what it says. And that's why Paul also said in Philippians 3, you know, where he says, I was born a, a Pharisee of the Pharisees. I was born the tribe of Benjamin concerning the law, blameless. But I want to give all that up. But notice what he says. Philippians 3, verses 8 to 11. I've preached this verse many times, but let's make sure you've heard it. <clears throat> Yet indeed, I count all things loss uh, for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things. I count them as rubbish. One translation says dung, that I may gain Christ, that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not, not, having my own righteousness from the law. Hope you all will hear that. Not having that righteousness, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness which is from God by faith. I've just read Philippians 3.9. It is a crucial verse to understand and I hope to accept, for all of you will accept it. <clears throat> that I may know him, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection. He goes on from there. Then he goes on to say, if I may attain the, re the, res the resurrection from the dead. He's, in the first part of verse 10, he's not talking about the resurrection. He's talking about his, Christ's resurrection. I want to know the power of his, of Jesus' resurrection. What's he getting at by that? Well, he explains it in many other verses that Christ comes to live in me and in you. Because he was resurrected, I should be a walking, talking, thinking, acting Jesus Christ on the earth, and so should you. There should be hundreds and hundreds of thousands of Jesus Christ walking the earth right now if we really understood this. <clears throat> so his death covered the penalty of sin. His life, his resurrection life, becomes our daily life. That's what God sees, daily life. Our new self is actually God's creation in us. We have to activate it. We have to let the new side be dominant. 
We have to let it dominate our lives because it actually is Christ in us. The nature that we focus on, the nature that we feed, the nature that you pay attention to, the nature that you give time to will dominate in your life. Cut out the time wasters. Cut out the, the things that lead you into sin that you may be participating in or watching or getting involved in. This new life is what helps us defeat sin and its temptations, to overcome and to be converted, to be worthy of our calling, worthy of the kingdom. <clears throat> Colossians 3, verses 2 to 4. We do have to be worthy. Colossians 3, verses 2 to 4. But as you'll see, my worthiness, my faith in my worthiness is not in me. The faith of my worthiness is letting Christ live in me. Boy, is he ever worthy. Colossians 3, verses 2 to 4. I was just hearing a song the other day, Worthy is the Lamb. Sent to me by a good friend out west. And Worthy is the Lamb indeed. <clears throat> That's out of Revelation. I think it's 5, verse 12, something like that. Colossians 3, verses 2 to 4. If I say something like that, I don't always have these in my notes. It just comes to me as I'm speaking, and I know approximately where it is. I can find it. I'm pretty sure it's Revelation. That's like, it's Revelation 5, verse 12. Revelation. Now let's read, read Colossians 3. Colossians 3, verses 2 to 4. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. Boy, how many problems would be solved if we'd all do that. For you died. You're looking at a cadaver. <laughs> I'm supposed to be dead. For you, and you are supposed to be dead. <laughs> you died. Your life, this is now your new life, is hidden with Christ now. With Christ in God. So we actually are in God the Father through Jesus Christ. You died, your life is hidden with Christ in God. Colossians 3, 3. When Christ, who is your life, who is our life, appears, then you'll also appear with him in glory. You died when Christ, your life, appears. Okay. Galatians 2, 20. Many of you might know this as a memory verse. Live it. Believe it. Galatians 2.20. Maybe write down in your notes, how am I evidencing that my old self is dead? Because you're supposed to be dead, the old self. Paul called it a cadaver that still came back to life enough to make him sin. But it's no longer I who sins, but sin that dwells in me. Romans 7 says it twice. Galat Galatians 2.20. I almost said galoshes. We used to wear galoshes in Canada. <laughs> Galatians 2, 20 and 21. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. But Christ lives in me. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith. I'm still flesh and blood, but I'm not. I, I'm not. I, I want to be living in the spirit, but, but the, the, we are flesh and blood. I live by faith in the Son of God. Not in me, not by faith in what I'll do. If I make my, my list of things and go through life that way. No, I have to have a conscious faith in God and the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. For me. I do, I do not set aside the grace of God. The grace of God. I don't want to set that aside. For if righteousness could come from the law, then Christ died in vain. Make of that what you will. That's what it says. Our own life and its fleshly nature must die. We must not be feeding it. We simply cannot live God's way by ourselves. You know you have the Holy Spirit. I hope you do. And if any of you aren't baptized yet and repented and baptized, you need to find a good minister who will baptize you and lay hands on you. Paul even said that even with the Holy Spirit, he definitely had the Holy Spirit, it wasn't enough. He still kept sinning. He needed the life of Christ himself. Imagine how much we would all change 
if we would do what all this says right here and let the old self die. The spirit will thrive if you feed on God's word. It loves to have that feeding, the word of God. And if we have what I call constant contact, the Bible says, Paul said, pray without ceasing. For many years I wondered, how is that even possible? We've got other things to do, and we do. So what I do is I still pray on my knees by my bed, sometimes right on the floor, right on the carpet, because worshiping God, if you look at all the places the word worship is used, the context is always where the people are bowing down, sometimes right to the ground, sometimes onto the, you know, that's, that's worshiping God. Worship services are not song services. I know a lot of you call it that. Worship is when we're bowing down in prayer and honoring God. I have a sermon on worship. Just write, write in the word worship in the search bar and hear it. But anyway, constant contact means that besides my prayers in my bedroom, all throughout the day, I'm shooting for 15, 20, 30 times a day to make contact with my Savior, with my Father. In those short bursts of prayer of a minute or two, I may be going out to let the dog out. But while I'm out there, I'm going to say, Father, thank you. Thank you in Jesus' name for this wonderful home you've given me, the yard, the beautiful flowers you made, the animals we love. Thank you so much for our children, for our grandchildren. Thank you for my wife. Thank you for the life you've given me. I praise you, Father. I praise you. And that might be the whole short prayer. And then later on, it might be a request. I'm being tempted by this or that. Yeshua, Jesus, I need you to come help me. That's Adam should have done in the garden. Get out of here, uh, Satan, serpent. Get out of here. I know who you are. Get out. <clears throat> he didn't. He should have said, Father or God in heaven, help us. Someone's trying to deceive my wife. I'm not deceived, but I don't want to give in to it either. That's feeding the spirit nature. That's the constant contact. That's opening the door to Jesus. Why is he outside the door of the Laodicean Revelation 3 church? Knocking on a door? Why is the door shut? Open that door. Invite him in. He's our door. He's the door to the sheepfold. And what are you doing to starve your fleshly nature? <clears throat> What are you doing to starve your fleshly nature? We canceled Netflix. We've had it for maybe, we'd had it for maybe two or three weeks. And we were watching a lot of the history uh, uh, movies and documentaries and things. I really enjoyed those. And then once in a while, I, I, we selected a movie or whatever. And the bad words, the profanity, taking God's name in vain, the F words, We'd watch maybe two or three, four minutes of it, and they have to turn it off. And then I started seeing nudity and gore. And I just said, my wife and I talked about it, and I, I, let's get rid of it. It's just, we don't need it. And you might as well be watching pornography, although pornography would go far worse in, in the sexual scenes, but, but it was bad enough. And it wasn't helping. It was wasting our time. It was putting wrong thoughts in my head. And... So we got rid of it. I've never really used Instagram and Twitter, but taking those off my phone, I never use them anyway, but less and less Facebook. I use Facebook to send an encouraging message or to see how others are doing, but I probably will quit it. I must not feed my flesh or waste time with those kinds of things. So many of these things, TikTok and others, which again are so addictive, don't do it. That's feeding your flesh. So what else can you do to starve your fleshly nature and feed the spiritual nature? Feed Christ living in you. Think about that. Make an assignment for you to think about. Now, how did Jesus himself operate with this? I'm going to put a bunch of scriptures in my notes, and I'll just glance at them quickly. You think, we think, of God, uh, I mean, of Jesus having such incredible power. He's the one who multiplied the fish and the loaves. He does the multiplication of the food twice, one to 4,000, one to 5,000. I think that's just 
is that just for men? Might have been women, women and children on top of that. And we think of him raising the dead, Lazarus and, and Jairus' daughter and so many others, I think three or four that he raised from the dead. We think of him walking on water, calming the storms. So many, many things he did. Did he do those? Do you know Jesus says it wasn't him? Because he was practicing, this is key, he was practicing this very thing I'm telling you about, that he realized that of himself he could do nothing. He needed the Father in him. He needed the Father working in him. So in John 5, 19, he says, Surely I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself, except what he sees the Father do. Now, John 5, 30, I can do of myself nothing. I don't seek my own will. I seek my Father's will. John 8, 28, 29. I do nothing of myself, but as my Father taught me, that's what I do. Uh, that's what I speak. And he who sent me, we're getting closer to what I'm getting at here now, John 8, 29. He who sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone. The Father has not left me alone. This principle of it's not you who's going to be doing these things, but you must let Jesus do them is a critical one. People have accused me of saying we don't have anything to do. I'm saying you have a lot to do, and that is to abide in Christ and open the door for him and let him run in our life. He will accomplish far more than you trying to do it yourself. It'll be God doing it. John 14 now, verses 8 to 11, Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that would be sufficient for us. Jesus said, Philip, haven't, we, have I been, haven't I been with you so long, and you, you still don't know me, Philip? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I'm in the Father, and the Father is in me? Now, we're looking for Christ to be in me, Christ to be our life. I no longer live. The life I live is Christ. Okay? We just read all that. My life is hidden in Christ and God, Colossians 3, 3. Now look what Jesus himself says. <clears throat> this is John 14, verse 10. The words that I, the second part of the verse, the words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority. But the Father who dwells in me does the works. The Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe in me, or believe me that I'm in the Father and the Father in me, or at least believe for the sake of the works themselves. Now, did you get what he just said? He just said to us, I'm not the one who multiplied the loaves and fishes for the 5,000. I'm not the one who raised Lazarus. I'm not. It looked like me, but the one doing it was my Father living in me and me opening the door for that keeping him there. John 14, 10, let me read it again. The words I speak to you, I don't speak on my own authority. But the Father who dwells in me does the works. My wife gave me this verse. I'm so happy. <laughs> it's exactly what I was looking for. An illustration of how it's not me doing these works. It's Jesus. It's Yeshua, salvation living in me doing the works that look like me, doing them when you're, if you're watching me, but it's not me. I don't want it to be me. So all these things that you think I've got to do or you've got to do, you're doing it through the power of Jesus living in you, not just the Holy Spirit. Paul said the Holy Spirit didn't give him enough. He wanted Jesus living in him. I'm going to read more of that later as we get along here. <clears throat> Did you get that? Yes, there are things you've been called to do. I need to make myself a note here someplace. Excuse me just a second. But if you're getting to the point, are you getting the point that Christ is our life? We must live in Christ, he and us. We now live, we now grow, we now overcome and change by Jesus living in us. If we're not living and growing and bearing fruit, it's because we're not abiding in the vine. John 15, you will grow in appreciation of the fact that we're saved by grace. We grow and we overcome by grace. 
will be converted. We're being converted by grace. And we will become a new person by God's favor, by grace. Through faith in our Savior. It's all God's doing as we have faith in Him, working in us by favor, by His grace. It's all by grace. Even the doing of it is by grace. Because it's not us. It's the grace of God working in us. Jesus does not save us from our sins and then leave us day by day to work it out ourselves. No. No. He becomes our life producing what we need to produce. Let's read John 15. I hope a little in a way that you may not have read it before. John 15, verse 1. I'm the true vine. My father is the vine dresser. I've jumped to verse 4. Abide in me and I in you. Abide means remain in, rest in, don't go away, stay with me. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you. Neither can you bear fruit of yourself unless you abide in me. I am the vine. Verse 5 now, you are the branches. Let's get it straight. Branches don't produce fruit. The vine does. The root does. It goes up the main trunk of the vine. It's not the branch. It looks like the branch did something because there's fruit on it. There's grapes on it. But he's saying the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. It's the vine who does it. Shoots it out to the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. Just like Yeshua said, he could do nothing without the Father. And the works that I do, it's not me doing it, it's the Father who did it. Verse 6, if anyone does not abide in me, then that's a branch that's breaking off, it finally does break off, is cast as a branch and is withered. They gather them up and throw them into the fire and they are burned. Yeah, there is a lake of fire. If you don't abide in him, if you do want to go off on your own, if you want to reject him, like Hebrews 6 talks about, those who are, it's impossible for those who are once enlightened, who received the gift of the Holy Spirit, who understood the word of God, all the things it says in Hebrews 6, if you then spit in God's face and Christ's face and walk away, knowing what you're doing, all you have to look forward to at, at that point is the lake of fire. There are people thrown in the lake of fire. There were people who fit the category of Hebrews 6, verses 4 to 6, who had the Holy Spirit and fell away purposely. What they should have been doing is abiding in Christ, remaining in Him. Hebrews 6, I'll put those in the notes. I think that's good enough to put in the notes. It's impossible for those who were once enlightened, who were pulled out of darkness into God's glorious light, who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift, have, re, have become partakers of the Holy Spirit, have tasted the good word of God. They understood scripture, the powers of the age to come. They understood some amount of prophecy. If they fall away to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify for themselves the Son of God, and put him to open shame. You weren't crucified with your clothes on. I think that's part of what he's saying here. You weren't crucified 10 feet up. You're crucified maybe two or three feet above. I mean, you were right there with the average person walking by. There are those in Matthew 25, 10 virgins, five had oil that was running out. They didn't stir up the spirit. They didn't renew the oil until it was too late. They were left out of the wedding party. Don't let that happen. Let Christ live in you instead. So it won't happen. Abiding, remaining takes a lot of effort. I'm human, just like you. There are times that I get distracted and I don't even feel like praying. There are times I get down and depressed, sulking, all that kind of stuff. There are times when the flesh seems more fun. If that's your concept, we don't understand God in whose presence 
is pleasure and joy forevermore. I think that's in Psalm 16. <laughs> Again, I don't have it. I think it's the end of Psalm 16. Don't feel like praying. That's when you better pray. I've had many of those short bursts of prayers when I go outside. Maybe I'm walking the dog or something. Going around the block. It might be 11 o'clock at night. I'll say, Father, I haven't prayed much today because I don't know what happened, but I need you more than ever. You don't feel like praying, pray anyway. Abiding, it's a life and death matter. When Jesus is what we're attached to and his life becomes ours, remember what he has already accomplished and will accomplish in us as well. He said the very night he was to be betrayed, in John 16, 33, be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. We can also overcome by faith in him. When he lives in us, 1 John 5, 4 and 5 says, whatever is born of God overcomes the world. We have to be born again, begotten from above. And if we have, 1 John 5, 4 says we have a, we're going to be overcoming the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Not faith in us. Who is he who overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God and living again in us, okay? He also said in the book of John, I don't have the scripture for this, I think it's John 14. I'll add it in my notes. John 14, I think verse, I won't guess the verse. John 14, <clears throat> the end of it. They're walking out now towards Gethsemane. The ruler of this world is coming. Talking about Satan. He has nothing in me. Nothing in me. Boy, I wish I could say that. Boy, do I want his life to be my life. The life that has nothing of Satan in him. The life of my Savior. We know we have to be counted worthy. There's so many verses that talk about needing to be counted worthy. So many. To attain the resurrection. So many verses that say we must be worthy of the gospel. Worthy of the Lord. Worthy of God. Worthy of the kingdom, if you have a concordance. Or just get Bible Hub and use the concordance portion to type in the word worthy and you'll see. <clears throat> if you don't have Bible Hub, it's free. Bible Sword, E-Sword. These things are free. I, I, I like Bible Hub. I, I have a program that's expensive, Bible Soft, that I bought more than two decades ago. I just love it. But, but Bible Hub is free. <clears throat> Worthy of the kingdom. Then in Revelation 4 and 5, in chapter 4, it's God the Father sitting on his throne. And they bring out the scroll that they want to open. But you have to be worthy to even look at the scroll, let alone look into it and touch it and hold it. And they start weeping. John starts weeping. John, the writer of Revelation. No one in heaven on earth was counted worthy enough to even come near the scroll. John wept. And then as we come to the end of 4 into chapter 5, Revelation, in comes the Lamb of God. And all heaven sang, Worthy is the Lamb. It said nobody in heaven, nobody on earth. God's saying who's going to be worthy to open this scroll. Nobody on earth or in heaven was worthy to open it except the Lamb. Revelation 5, 11 and 12. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, living creatures, the, uh, the 24 elders. The number of them was 10,000 times 10, thousands and thousands and thousands. He is saying, he's saying millions. I don't know why this is overcoming me, I'm sorry. Millions 
said with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power, riches, and wisdom, and strength, and honor, and glory, and blessing. Then he does open it up. But the next verse, I think, says, And then every living thing in heaven and earth said the same thing, blessing him. So in Yeshua, the Lamb of God, when he's my life, actively living in me, I'm letting him live, I'm inviting him in daily. In fact, my many short bursts of prayer, it's exactly that. Yeshua, Yeshua, please come inside to live in me. Please, I open the door to you. I want you with me. Don't be outside of my life. I want you convicting me of sin and convicting me of righteousness. Your righteousness. So the key, our biggest part in our salvation, I believe, our biggest work, our biggest effort, our biggest part in being saved, because we our works cannot save us. Romans 3.28 is so clear on that. Our works cannot save us. Our works cannot save us. But Jesus' works sure can. It looks like me, just like it looked like Jesus raising the dead and doing all the works. It wasn't. It was Father. Jesus as a flesh and blood man had no power to walk on water, to calm the storms. He was a man. But he let and he invited and he lived with Father in him. So abiding in Christ is our work. He will produce the fruit. I'm going to read that in a minute. Well, I'll tell you now. Philippians 1.11, uh, producing fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ. So even the fruit of good things aren't supposed to be me. It's supposed to be Jesus. I'm the branch. I mean, I'm the vine. You're the branches. If you abide in me, the vine, he said, you will bear much fruit, for without abiding in me, you can't. So don't think that I'm preaching we have nothing to do. We have to pray when we don't feel like it. We have to pray for God and Christ to come live in us all the time. Salvation is not a do-it-yourself project. Our part in salvation is to abide, to cling to, stay attached to, live with, hang in there with, remain in, seek constantly Jesus Christ. And that means we got to get rid of junk. Time is short. You don't have time for Netflix. You don't have time for Instagram and TikTok. For God's sake, get rid of TikTok for sure. People are dying. Children are dying from it. Watch the news if you aren't aware of that. So our faith will be evidenced by work that looks like us doing it. It's Christ doing it. Abraham's faith justified him because he was willing to obey God. When God said, sacrifice your son, your only son, just like I'm going to sacrifice my only son someday. And Isaac went up there carrying the wood and the fire, picturing Christ carrying the cross, or the cross beam at least. Abraham was proving he was in God and God in him. Abraham was giving the evidence of that relationship of faith. When we really have faith, we do. Faith is proven by action. A lady wrote me that sentence. I thought it was a good one. Faith is proven by action. Very true. I'm saying that action isn't me. That action looks like me, but it is Christ in me doing it. In fact, whole chapters of chapters Hebrews 3 and 4 tell us of Israel coming out of, out of Egypt and in the wilderness, and it mentions obedience and unbelief in the same verse. You go back to the end of chapter 3, Hebrews 3, verses 18 and 19. On your own, you'll see what I mean. i got to catch up a little bit here. Again, who produces the fruit? Jesus does. The vine does. He's the vine. We're the branches. We only display the fruit. Branches don't produce the fruit. The vine does and puts it out there on the branches 
to show off the fruit of the vine. I display Jesus Christ. I don't display Philip Shields. I want to display, not when I display me, it's bad stuff. <laughs> it seems that way. <laughs> I want to display, display my Savior. Philippians 1.11 is very clear, being filled with fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ. There are a lot of assignments in the Bible and the whole New Testament. There must be hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. You know, forgive one another or, if, or you won't be forgiven. Go to your brother alone if there's offense. Do unto others as you'd have others do unto you. Judge not that you be not judged. If you lust, you've committed adultery. If you hate, you've committed murder. And on and on and on and on. Remember, without Christ, I can do nothing, at least not for long. With Christ, you can do all things. Remember Philippians 4.13? Without him, we can't do a thing spiritually. With him, Paul tells us in Philippians 4.13, I believe that's correct, we can do all things. Just as the one who multiplied the loaves and fish was the Father. But doing it through Christ, it looked like Christ. Ephesians 6.10, I'm going to talk about a little bit more here so you really get this concept. The other thing we're told to do is put on the armor of God. Don't go out there in your underwear fighting the world and temptation, go out there with the armor of God on you, Ephesians 6. But notice how that passage about the armor of God begins in, in verse 10. Ephesians 6, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be, be strong in the Lord. Let's say be strong in your conviction that you can do it. That you must do it. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Then it says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand. And notice so many things that are in the armor are really pointing to Christ. Be girded about the waist with a, with, a, with a belt of truth. Put on the helmet. Whose truth? I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Okay, he is truth. And he says, put on the helmet of salvation. Might as well say the helmet of Yeshua. In Hebrew, that would be the word. He is truth, the breastplate of righteousness. It's his righteousness that we're, we're displaying, as I've shown you. Take the sword of the Spirit. So the sword is the Spirit. And he goes on to say in Ephesians 6 that the Spirit is the Word of God. Who's the Word of God? It's Jesus. But again, verse 10, be strong in the Lord, the power of his might. Even that armor you're putting on is him. Helmet of salvation and all of that. Focus on him. Please stop focusing on yourself. Yeshua said, as we come to Passover, do this in remembrance of me. And we eat of the bread, the unleavened bread, and, we, and it's broken and, and passed around. We take a piece of unleavened bread, and he said, this is my body. Stop picturing you being righteous now. It's picturing Yeshua. We're taking him inside of us. Can't be us. Leavened bread will never be leavened after this. Unleavened bread, I mean. Cannot be leavened after this. It's already done baking and all that. But I can. I can go sin. So that unleavened bread we take is Christ. The armor is Christ. Are you guys getting it? We've got to get stop thinking that it's about us. It's not about us. And what we have to do, grace is all about what God does. And even what we're doing is Christ and God doing it. It's not me. I pray to God some of you will learn this. Because some of you don't see it. It is so vital. Isn't he the Aleph Tav, the first and the last? Isn't he the Alpha and Omega, the A to Z? He's the last word in our life. 
is the first word in our life. Philippians 1.6. Notice whose job it is to finish this process of salvation. I say process because ultimately, yes, those who endure to the end, those who are there in the end, those who are faithful to the end, are the ones who will come back with Yeshua. Uh, those who are with him are, are called, they're the called, they're chosen and faithful. Faithful. You got to be there, faithful. So let's read Philippians 1 6 carefully. Being confident of this, Paul says, I know this. this is, I'm very confident about this. That he who has begun a good work in you, that's God, will complete it. That also tells me, yes, technically, our salvation is completed when Christ returns. You heard me say it. It'll make some of you very happy. But I'm not going to deny either, though, the verses that Paul tells us, for we have been saved. You have been saved by grace through faith, not of yourselves. You didn't do it. Not by works, lest anyone should boast. There are many verses that say we're already saved. This says, I'm confident the one who began it will complete it. I'm focusing on the will completed part here. It means it's not totally completed yet, maybe. But in my heart and mind, my salvation is assured. You ask me if I'm saved, I'll say, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely no question I'm saved. And I'm going to hang on to the very end. Like Paul said, you know, I know there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Now, right now, I have to fight it. I, I've failed too many times. Certainly in my past, my 30, 40, 50 years ago. Yeah, I certainly did. But I hope we're getting better. I hope we're overcoming. I hope we're, the sins we do aren't killing people or adultery or things like that. They may have been in the past. Are you getting what I'm saying here? We'll complete it till the day of Jesus Christ. Completing what God started is God's job, not mine. He hasn't completed it yet. It says in Philippians 1, 6, he, God, will complete it. Not me. Not you. Somebody wrote me that God's done his job, the rest is up to... No, no, no. God starts it. God finishes it. Completes it. Jesus is the author of our salvation, our faith, and finisher of it. Getting his kids there in the end is his job, and he's going to do everything he has to to make sure we're there. We'll come looking for us if we stray. He'll discipline us if that's what we need. Some of us will have to, I hope it's not us, in the sense of me, you, but some will have to go through the great tribulation. Revelation 3, the last group, the latest scenes, it does say, buy from me gold refined in the fire. The group before then seems that they'll be freed and escape the coming time of tribulation coming. Get zealous. Repent. I could say this has been a really good study for me because it's made me just realize where I was getting lackadaisical, lacking zeal and all of that. Yeah. But don't get me wrong. Christ will want to see good works in our life. Want to see good works. And Philippians 1.11, those fruits of righteousness are by Christ. And then Ephesians 2, let's just read it again. I've said it a couple times. Verse 8 to 10 this time. And I want to focus on verse 10 this time, but let's start in verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And when God starts something, he will finish it. When God starts a project, he's not one of these guys who quits. He's the God of the universe. By grace you have been saved through faith. I have faith in God to complete it. And that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. Salvation is God's gift. Eternal life is God's gift. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. But, he goes on in verse 10, you're not saved by works, but you're sure called to do good works. 
You're called to be like the sheep in Matthew 25, who when we see someone in need, Jesus said, you did it to me. I was in prison and you came and visited me. How many of us do that? I was hungry and you fed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I want to thank the handful of you, and that's about it, who helped support us to be able to do things like that in various parts of the world and even here in America with older people who have Parkinson's and strokes who need a little help. Thank you for helping the least of these, my brethren. Verse 10, we are his workmanship. Ephesians 2 verse 10, created in Jesus, in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You see a tornado come through, and if you've got an urge, you see that Samaritan's purse is down there helping out, why not? If you feel an urge to send some money to Samaritan's purse and help them help these people who've lost everything, dead people all around, houses blown away, Yeah, you've been called to do good works. Our Bible also says have been saved. In the Greek, it's in the present tense, in the Greek perfect, perfect tense. I mean, perfect tense. It denotes, I'm quoting from a, one of these books that, that, that explains all this stuff, denotes completed action as well as continuing action going forward. So yes, we're being saved. And yes, I can have confidence he'll do his job. It's his job to complete it in me. It's his job to wake me up enough to I will, res will respond if I'm getting lackadaisical. Even though we do these works, though, remember these works do not save us. We're created to do good works, but salvation is by grace. You're a new creation in Christ, and Jesus loved to do good things. He went around doing good things. So we are to do good over and over. It's said in Peter by Peter by Paul. Jesus went about doing good. Acts 10, 38, someone there, I think it's Paul there, maybe Peter, one of them, was, was talking about how Jesus went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed of the devil. Acts 10, 38. So my point is, whatever Jesus likes to do and did do, you know what? He's going to come back and do it in you again and again and again. And he'll be the one doing it. <clears throat> of course, he was obedient. Philippians 2.8. He was obedient. So he will live obediently in me and in you. <clears throat> 1 John 2, verses 3 to 6. By this we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him, I know Christ, I know God, and does not keep his commandments is a liar. Truth is not in him. 1 John 2, verse 4. Verse 5, whoever keeps his word... So we have to know the word to keep it. We have to be in the book. And we have to not only read and know the book, but get to know the author. Get to know the author. You're not going to be saved because your Bible looks like a coloring book. You will be saved if you come to know the one who made that book, who is that book. You're not going to be saved because you're part of a particular church. Everybody else can go to hell, you might think. No, no, no. I'm not using profanity there. I'm just making, we're going to have eternal life. They're going to have the lake of fire. Is that better for you? No. God is not willing that any should perish. He's going to work really hard to have a, a good number in that first resurrection. Whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we're in him. He who says he abides in him ought to, Remember, abides in him, ought himself also to walk as he walked. So when Jesus said, abide in me, one of the definitions of abide, abide is live like I lived. Walk like I walked. There's another one in 1 John. I don't remember exactly where it was now. It might be in chapter 4. But it says, that you who abide in him, talk about him. Give testimony who he is. Hebrews 5, verse 9, even Yeshua became the author of eternal foundation. I mean, 
became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. So yes, we've been called to obey, and we know that Jesus obeyed perfectly. If he didn't obey perfectly, then he would have been sinning. He never broke the Sabbath, by the way. He broke the Sabbath traditions of the Pharisees and Sadducees and whatnot, but he never broke God's law, or he could not be my Savior and yours. Okay, I'm going to read one more thing here. 1 Corinthians 3, verses 9 to 15. This will surprise you, I think. <clears throat> Remember, Paul is talking to the Corinthians, and he says, For we are God's fellow workers. 1 Corinthians 3, verses 9 to 15. You are God's field. You are God's building. According to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and other builds on it. Let each one be careful how he builds on it. For no one can lay a different foundation than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now notice, if anyone builds, this is the work you're doing now. You're building, you're doing work. Anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, and precious stones. Those are good things. Precious things. Fireproof things. Or wood, hay, and straw. Uh, wood, wood, hay, and straw. Or stubble. Those things do burn out. Each one's work will become clear for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. So remember, we're rewarded by our works. In this one here, he's saying oh, salvation's God's gift, but now you guys are working on it. And, but if you're building with straw and hay instead of precious stones and gold and silver that can't be burned, let's continue reading now in verse 14. If anyone's work which he's built with endures, he will receive a reward. Verse 15, if anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss. Why? Because it got burned up. But remember, we're saved by grace as a gift, and works give us rewards. But in this case, the guys who built with wood, hay, and straw, their reward got burnt up because it got burnt up. It's gone. But he, again, I'll read verse 15. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss. But he himself will be saved, yet as though through fire. So don't look at people whose works aren't so good. If they've accepted the Lord Jesus as their Savior and they're trying their best to change and overcome and to let him be their life, maybe their works aren't so good. Maybe their works will be burnt up. Their reward will be burnt up, but they'll be there. Okay, if anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved. Yet it's through fire. God's not going to easily let you go. There's no real reward for these folks, but, they're gonna be, but they'll have the gift of salvation. He will be saved. They'll have the gift of eternal life. So uh, let's conclude with, 2 Corinthians, same chapter, this is, no, 2 Corinthians 3, verses 17 and 18. I'm going to read this for time's sake, out of the New Century Version. The Lord is the Spirit. I'll put the New King James in my notes too. The Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. Our faces then are not covered. We don't come in with veiled faces that block understanding. No, we're free. We understand. We all show the Lord's glory, not my glory, not yours. We all show the Lord's glory. Now, if all these works I'm supposed to be doing to be saved are my works, and I'm the one doing them, then I've got something to boast about, and I've got glory. Again, we're being told it's, we show off the Lord's glory. We're branches that display the fruit. All right? We have fruits of righteousness which are by Christ, and we have the confidence God will finish what he started in us. He will complete it. How? I no longer live. The life I live, I live by faith in Jesus Christ. How? My life is hidden in Christ and God. We all show the Lord's glory, and we're being changed to be like Him. We're being changed to be like Him. We're being transformed into His image more and more. This change in us brings ever greater glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Anyway, in case I, I don't know how much time I have left here, but in case 
thank you all for coming, but I'll keep on talking in case I have another minute. But if not, thank you for coming, and I hope this has helped you. And have a wonderful Passover. There will be Passover messages coming. When we abide in the vine we, and we let the old self die, when we seek new life that's Christ in Jesus, the way we do that, remember, open the door to him, invite him in. Many times a day, invite him in. Come into my life. Help me get stronger in these areas of my life where I'm feeling so weak. Remember the constant contact, short prayers, calling out your spiritual 911 for help when you're weak. Even if you don't feel like it, even if you feel like giving in, that's when you really got to call out. Remember to do deep, deep dives into God's word. Oh, the spiritual nature in us, Jesus in us loves that. Feeding on it. So shout out for joy. Shout out the joy that you have been saved. You will be there at the end. You will be faithful. Continue in Christ, letting him live in you. Letting him be your life. And yes, you will be worthy. Yes, you will overcome. Yes, you will be in the first resurrection. Like Revelation 20, verse 5 and 6 talks about. You will be in the first resurrection. You will be in the kingdom of God. All to the glory, all to the glory of God and Yeshua, Jesus Christ. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you just so thankful and grateful that you are God who loves. We're coming to your Passover, Yeshua. Thank you so much. Thank you for what you are, who you are, and what you're doing. Continue to do how you saved us with your blood, and you're continuing to save us moment by moment, life by life, moment, minute by minute, as we live, as you live in us. Fill us with your holy anointing. Fill us with Holy Spirit. Come live in us. Let us be counted worthy of you and your calling in the kingdom. We praise you. We honor you, Lord Jesus. We praise you, dear Father. Your immense love and patience is incredible. We thank you. We praise you. In Yeshua's mighty name. Amen. Visit the Light on the Rock website where you can view additional videos, over 600 sermons and blogs as a scriptural study reference for those who desire to have a closer relationship with God the Father and His Son Jesus Christ and learn more about His incredible plan for all mankind. We are not a church, but a nonprofit organization providing in-depth biblical studies free for all who would like to visit our site. The Light on the Rock Foundation also supports an orphanage in Kenya, providing financial resources to support their living costs and education. We never ask for money. However, any donations are greatly appreciated and will be used to support the Kenyan Orphanage and our site. Thank you for visiting, and if you find the site beneficial to you and your family, please share with others. <music>